So I've started recording, but I'll add it. That's okay. I don't, I don't even know if I uh, introduce this or what I'm going to say. I actually, uh, I really took my confidence to hit from the times I have spoken, so I try to avoid it. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So, it's like chipping cigar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Hopefully, I have the, the aroma on that occasion. Uh, I, feel, I feel really cringy, like using the term podcast. No, podcast is fine. Yeah. Jumping on the bandwagon. But yeah, um, just keep it as a conversation. Just uh, try to ask me questions naturally. I'll pump you a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I suppose I've got to give a wee bit of an introduction. Um, perfection is the enemy of good. Perfection is the enemy of getting anything done. So we're just starting very basic. We've got an iPhone, we don't have any speakers, no mics. I'm gonna grow from up there. I'm very honored and flattered and uh, deeply thankful that Michael is here to help me launch the very first ever sit down conversation. Um, I, 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 don't know, I don't know if we've got a title. Uh, I sketched them out and I can't remember where they are, but basically it's gonna be like a sort of Pro union uh, place to talk, mm -hmm. have conversations. Hopefully, get people from right across the spectrum. And um, for me, I was just looking at what's going on online. Uh, the Share Future podcast, Think Thirty Two. Uh, can't remember the names of them, but plethora, an uh, abundance of uh, nationalist, republican-minded podcasts mm -hmm. and spaces online, and nothing for the unionist mindset, apart from sort of token appearances. Mm. So uh, yeah, title to be uh, confirmed, but this is sort of, a, we see this as a pilot, a wee pilot episode. Mm. So uh, that's enough for me. Um, we'll get straight into it. Uh, introduce yourself, what's your name? Who are you? What do you do? So I'm Michael Palmer, I'm 27 from Newton Arts. I work in the health service. Uh, I'm a member of the UP and I stood for the UP in the 2019 council election. And outside of politics, I lift weights, play video games, fly down to go swim But uh, was it big muscle unionism? Big muscle unionism, yeah. I mean, <laughs> more, more muscular, more athletic, I like it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that Neil Wilson guy as well. He's another big, 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 big oh, muscle yes. unionist. He does squats and everything. Oh, squats and deadlifts, I've been good. Yeah. yeah, I think unionists got a bad um, rep because at the elections and so forth, the would be Paisley and his squad would just be sitting around the burger van eating burgers and hot dogs and coke. Oh, well, that's a protein. The coke maybe isn't so good. But. <laughs> um, and then a bit more about you. Can you tell, tell us about um, your early years? So my early years, uh, I've always lived in Nards, and I suppose I went to my about high school and reached high school grammar school, and I uh, obviously, uh, I think my dad, I, my dad died of alcoholism, I would have been a big part of my life, and then my mum raised me and my brother, so... Sure, that was hard. Oh yeah, I was tough and all. Do you drink now? Uh, do I drink? Yeah. Uh, very, very rarely, I'm a social drinker, I think maybe that's where it comes from, so I sort of try to avoid any yeah. kind of addictive substances or anything like that. And uh, yeah, basically I was sort of my early life and I probably was quite withdrawn in my teenage years. I probably didn't come out of a shell for my like, twenties and I would spend quite a lot of time playing video games. Did you go to Regent House or something like that? I went to my brother high school for GCSEs and then Regent High School for A-Levels. What's it, Mobile? Uh, my brother high school, I don't know. I never heard of that. It's, uh, well back then anyway, it was sort of, it was probably more working class school as it was. So I, when I went there, I mean, uh, a lot of my friends would be in bands and things like that. And oh yeah? I, <laughs> I go to Regent House and then uh, everyone's nobody really is into bands yeah. and they're all very well behaved and all that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Regent House is the kind of, I think, uh, the leading. All, uh, when you look at the exam results, it's more or less all uh, the capital maintained um, schools top it. And in terms of like the state schools or whatever you call them, uh, Regent House is probably the best in terms of exam results, so great school. It's a very good school. I mean, even on Regent House and, and uh, Mathilda High School, Mathilda High School, there wasn't as many opportunities, there's not many subjects, but if you go to Regent High School, you know, it's filled with opportunities, it's filled with subjects to do, and I do feel I've been disadvantaged by the education system here, okay. uh, quite badly, because had I had the subject choice, if I could have studied drama and things like that, I mean, I could have 
yeah. the fight of a person. Yeah. Um, when, the, when I used to play region in rugby, it was, it was really interesting because I suppose being up in Lack of Belt, very mixed, and um, it, was up, it was always known to talk about in the plus how there was a, the, the, the full back had a huge boot because he used GA player mm. and he'd boot the ball the length of the pitch. So, other than that, I just assume it was sort of like a nice mix of. You know, it wasn't a homogenous. The region is, it, is it quite mixed, school. Uh, region, it, yeah, it was mixed. It was uh, mostly Protestant, I'd say, but there was there were the Catholics in it as well. There were those issues when I've been discussed about. I think my yeah. last year would have been mostly Protestant, but again, okay. I, I, I we never be really asked those questions. Yeah, of course, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it wasn't a big deal. It was just like we played GA, so we could kick the ball more, so we can do thank you the pitch and get the good. Um, sorry, she didn't pass your 11 plus. Uh, I got a C to my 11 plus, which is more or less a fail, really. Yeah. Yeah. Do and big difference then between the two schools and the school and the school. Yeah, I mean, if you look at school, I remember the school magazine coming up, it's a few pages long. Yeah. School magazine for each of high schools on pages. Yeah. On pages. So, I mean, it's. it's the the, the disadvantage education system is real. Yeah, and uh, what were your GCSEs? You did very well. I uh, did well in my GCSEs. I was just someone who studied and studied. And I was at Mobile, you did your GCSEs? At Mobile, yeah. And then you did so well, you got into region? Got into region, yeah. yeah. And I'm sure you suffered a wee bit of, like, a bit of a hard time for making an effort, did you? Uh, yeah, I mean, in Mobile, at that time, I don't know what it's like now, uh, studying oh. would have been for nerds. Yeah, really yeah. Hard. And success wasn't really something that you know you wanted to achieve back then. Would you believe it? Uh, in region high was a completely different culture, mm. and they're all about law and medicine. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Uni. yeah, that was my experience. You know, went to Inns from the corner. Um, did did, did, did well in my eleven plus. You know, thanks to my dad. I wasn't a strong student, but my dad really put a lot of time in, into me. Um, but that said, you know, as a grammar school, it, there's an interesting contingent. You know, of, of boys from the rural area, a lot of boys from Shankill. Um. And but of course there was people who were obsessed with studying, but generally it was perceived not to be cool, to, to, to be smart and to work hard. Um, so so, so I, I understand that. Um, the funny thing I found out was I, I remember speaking to a Methody boy, and uh, uh, he said they would have perceived the, the, the ones as sort of the, the ruffians. Yeah, I was perceived as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it's I, the way it was sort of it, it's it's up. Uh, a lot of boys would see as boys of posh tops and whatever, but it's, it was interesting that maybe Methody, because they're even posher, that they saw that this one's of ruffians. Um, Stephen Nolan went in, so there's a lot of, <laughs> a lot of, uh, big, you know, very, quite an influential school, so it's a we have tip to that, that place. But um, that's that's interesting, though, that um, you you re you really thrived at Regent. Yeah, I mean, it was very tough because you had obviously I had to make new friends, I was studying new subjects. Uh, I had lost all my old friends. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, if you can call them friends, acquaintances, probably more. Yeah. And then, of course, I was gay at the time as well. So back then, you know, being gay in school was an absolute no-no. You would have been bullied for life. So I had to keep that a secret. Yeah. I, I never had any relationship with like that. Still don't have any relationships, but uh, yeah, all that stuff was never really developed. So uh, school was tough. We yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People say that it's the happiest days of your life. Mm, not for me. <laughs> yeah. Same. I I struggle with the whole being institutionalized. Um, and with exams, I, I worked hard, but there's um, there's a lack of freedom. So yeah, I'd do something similar. Um, and those those fellows at Mobile did I take it you did exception, they did well, but all the other ones sort of failed. I say exception, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and what, what did they do? Did they go and get a trade or? Well, you see, I was it. You went into a job. You either got a job, did a trade, or you went to tech. I mean, I had to go and play my intelligence, so I had a high test. Yeah, 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 that's the thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and but they're all doing well now. They, 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 um, see them on Facebook. So, some of them are in the army, some of them are doing well, some of them are a bit, I think, depressed and they're on maybe addictive substances and things yeah. like that. But yeah, yeah, that's what happens. Yeah. Um, and then just uh, more generally, you know, so what, what age are you again? You're 27? Uh, 27. 27. Uh, I suppose I was going to ask you about Belfast and Northern Ireland generally, but just before we get to that, tell us then what happened then after school. Where, where, where did you go? Where did you study? Uh, after A levels. Mm -hmm. So I went to University of Ulster Jordanstown to study yeah. politics because I got an MA level politics. So it seemed like the right thing to do. And I, I think it was the right thing to do because I mean, obviously, I came into contact with Republicans for the first time, and that was obviously a big change. 
and debated with them and how to learn Irish names and things like that, which I've never encountered Irish names before. So that was my first uh, exam of integrated, well, I suppose, uh, meeting the other side. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I, yeah, I think I, I obviously did well in politics there and I got a 2-1 on it. And I suppose I have a five jobs which require a degree. But if I could do it again, I probably, I'm not sure if I would go to university. I think it'd be better to do some more vocational, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's you you do a whole podcast on education. It was Colin Eastwood there said, given the scandal that's happened with the, um, the, the, the grades being wrong, that now more than ever, we need more people going to university to drop the cap. And I'm like, whoa, hold on. You know, university, from my experience, is not the key. Mm-hmm. It doesn't necessarily put you the right skills. You know, this university experience dominates the curriculum a lot of, for a lot of people. So, um, yeah, I think there's, there's a lack of, um, we overvalue university and the spars and the mean, you know, the, the traditional trades and even just wit and the hustle and getting out there. You know, my favourite quote, um, I think it's Seth Godin said, you know, grades are an illusion, passion and uh, insight are reality. So um, it's interesting uh, that, you, that you mention that. Um, and then, so you get your 2-1 then, what, what, what did you do? So after university? Yeah. Um, I was unemployed for probably at least a year and a half anyway, so I was on benefits for quite a while and that, that was just the way it was. I mean, I love people who say, oh, you can go and get a job. No, you can get yeah, a job, yeah. you want jobs out there. Yeah. And the, I suppose it took me a long time, I suppose I got into a graduate intern scheme with the NHS. Yeah. I did that for a year, but it only lasted a year and a half that I was unemployed. So I had to then just apply for all these different jobs and I eventually landed in the NHS again. Yeah. And um, so you're... Bookings and what have you? Bookings, so all those uh, cancer appointments you see uh, that I'm talking about, I do some of those. I would book a lot of appointments, I would uh, do a lot of administration with doctors and nurses. Yeah, and then outside of that, um, you're a member of the UP you stood mm-hmm. and you're quite active as a writer. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose politics really comes in handy for that bit. So, yes, I, I write quite academically on politics, uh, particularly unionism, lawism. Uh, popular culture, ideology, and I also uh, wrote a dissertation on lawism as well, which oh, yeah. I, it's actually published on Struggle too, well, a concise right. version of it. You must send me uh, the link to that, I would say that. <laughs> um, and then there's a couple of things if we get into, we'll leave it for the moment. I just want to keep it um, very general. You, what, you grew up in Newton Arch, um, like, like me, you're a child of the peace. You could say you're a peace process baby. Mm, peace baby. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, technically. Uh, I call it, we, we kind of live in Woolsey's world, in Bill Woolsey. Oh, right. oh yes, yes. You know, I was walking around the cathedral quarter and you know, what, what, what would Belfast be like if you Bill Woolsey and um, Willie Jack and uh, all the pioneers around there? You know, it's Belfast is just light years apart from what it was in like say 98 or 99. Yeah, I mean, Belfast is, I mean, you've got obviously the gay bars in Belfast, you've got all the different entertainment in Belfast. I mean, for me, I live in Newton Arts, but I spent quite a lot of time in Belfast. Mm-hmm. Because Newton Arts, there's just pubs, and that's really it. Doesn't mean Newton Arts is pretty. Uh, it's bleak enough, isn't it? I mean, there's, there's, in fairness, there are a lot of shops, but I mean, that's daytime for for the nightlife. I'd say probably anyone who lives around Belfast, you go into Belfast for the nightlife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, just generally, in terms of where we are in Belfast and Northern Ireland, it's you, you see it as a good thing. Yeah, Belfast is good, but the rest of Northern Ireland. Um, there's obviously deprivation, there's lack of opportunities. I, I just find everywhere is Belfast based and in Newton Arts, I mean, I, I don't even know what you'd do for jobs there unless you get a job in local shops or pubs or restaurants. I, I don't know what there are really in Newton Arts. Yeah, yeah, the dark, it's like talk about London being a dark star, just sucking in everything and mm-hmm. causing, you know, just the north and the regions are just uh, ignored and it's the same down south with Donegal and what have you. And the, Counties like Leitrim and what have you. So uh, uh, it's interesting, you know, if you, you, you got young politicians like Daniel Crossan who, who, who I know, you know, what he, he's clamouring every day to get a better road connection up to the northwest. Mm. Um, so that's, that's something to be addressed. I'm thinking you're going to be saying, yeah, everything's rosy and well in Belfast and Northern Ireland. I'm, I'm, I'm a good bit of a cheer, cheer, cheerleader for, the, for this place, but you're right to talk about the deprivation and, and the problems. and all that comes with it, the suicide and what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, what about uh, getting into a bit more in depth straight into your politics? You, you, you have meant, you did mention it before. This is quite like me. Um, you know, my mum was a big Anne Lowe fan. Mm-hmm. Um, I 
it's just quite staunch at the same time. So she, I think, kind of grew up in like a alliance minded house. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> um, and you said you, you were fairly in them, but you, you, your politics changed. Um, well, I suppose I, my mother's from a unionist background, she's always voted UUP, probably always will, and uh, my stepdad would be a bit more alliance -y. But um, in terms of alliance, yes, I was originally a member of the Alliance Party 2009 2013, then UUP from 2013 onwards. I was quite liberal and idealistic and naive, I suppose, and I sort of, uh, my politics matured and sort of became a bit more realist yeah. in my thinking. But I still haven't lost that liberalism, I'm still quite socially liberal, but on economics and things like that, I'd be more pragmatic. I do recognise there is deprivation and there does need to be government intervention yeah. to correct that. But what, what was it that, um, what was it that sort of, you said you had a bit of a rude awakening or a bit mm -hmm. of a, what was it that? The, the big thing for me was the flag protest and the flag decision in 2012. So when I saw the union flag being taken down, which I mean, I, I don't mind designated days, but I think the way it was taken down, it could have been done with more sensitivity, it could be done with more respect. I am a Democrat, so I have to accept the decision, of course, but I, I just feel it wasn't very fair. I feel unionism wasn't really consulted. I feel there should be more respect shown towards unionism. So that was sort of my awakening, and I, I just felt it was very badly handled. Yeah. And the flag protests were a disaster. Anyone who thinks that decision yeah. was good, it was a disaster. But wait, so wait, 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 what do you mean? So you disagree with. You, you agree with the, the democratic choice, but you, you, you say the context and the, the subterfuge, maybe there's a bit of subterfuge with it, or the... I mean, say the flag is, I mean, I, I never even knew there was a flag there until somebody pointed out yeah, to me. Yeah. And Same. The flag decision, I just I just honestly didn't see what the big deal was, because yeah. that's sad, you're not inside, you know, you, you don't even look at it, so it's above head yeah. so you don't even see it, you know. <laughs> so, you, you disagree with it coming down, mm -hmm. but you accept the democratic wish, but what what you're saying is um, the protests are wrong. The well, the I, I'm sympathetic at the start, but I don't agree with fans. I don't agree with blocking ambulances. That, that happened uh, years ago. I mean, I think uh, ambulances were being blocked emergency services. So I don't agree with that. I don't agree with the white line protest. I think that's a bit yeah, silly. Yeah, yeah. But I, I mean, I'm sympathetic at the start, but that, if they're going to protest, but you need, there needs to be an outcome, and yeah. you're not going to get an outcome. Yeah, I suppose I, 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 it's a comment made, maybe for me to comment very briefly on that because you know. At the time, I think I didn't even have a chance to say whether or not I disagreed with the flag coming down or not, mm -hmm. because I was just bombarded with all these images of and news bulletins of the rioting and the vulgarity and the <coughs> overflow of emotion and rage, which I just saw as incredibly damaging mm -hmm. to loyalism, unionism, and to, to the link. Um, maybe as I step back, I can see you know, the subterfuge and the underhand plays that's going on, um, you know, at the time Peter Robinson was to call for um, more integrated education, he was sent as an apartheid and so on and so forth, so really rocked the boat. But yeah, I, I was dead against those protests um, and came out pretty hard against it. But I, I think a lot of people may have confused my heavy criticism of loyalism and unionism as a rejection of loyalism and unionism as opposed to, you know, um, I'm still that way, that way minded, but I'm just heavily criticising them. So, um, but for me, I mean, in, in terms of lawless, I mean, I grew up with lawless, I grew up, I mean, I'm probably consider lawless now, but um, I, in terms of saying that decision, in Orange North Down, for example, we have a legislator named after Blair Mayne, who mm -hmm. is a war hero. Yeah. There's a whole fuss over that. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, in Newton Arts, even Catholics, you know, they have a problem with Blair Mayne. I've yeah. never heard anyone have a problem with Blair Mayne. And there's even a recent attack on, you know, the Union flag. So you know there's a Union flag that flies in 20 centimeters. I mean, yeah. they want that down as well. And oh, really? I haven't heard that. Oh, yeah, that's true, yeah. Who's, who's bringing that forward then? So I think, from my memory, I can't remember if it was Alliance or Green Party, but there was a proposal anyway to bring that down, and thankfully it was defeated. But I, I just I just find it petty because it's a Union flag in the town centre of Newton Arts. Yeah. It's beside Statue of Liberty yeah. and a war hero. You know, yeah. it's not doing any harm. So what happens down south? Will they be... If there's United Ireland, will there be designated days and restrictions? Well, that's just I went, when I've been in uh, Ireland, uh, they fly flags that there's no tomorrow. I mean, there's GA flags everywhere, there's Irish flags everywhere. I mean, there's Irish pubs all over the world, and there's, they're always flying Irish flags, so yeah. I mean, can't really fly flags, you know? <laughs> yeah, 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 fair enough. Um, um, but I remember, you know, me, me and you chat a fair bit um, online because, you know, uh, I, I like your confidence, I like. Uh, you're a unique individual. Um, 
your part of the LGBT community, which we'll get into in a bit. Um, but I, I, you know, just in our conversation, I, I remember you saying quite a while ago, um, you were, you, because 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 our, we, we, we've had a shift, an evolution. Remember, remember you saying, did you not say um, in terms of being at university that sort of helped, had sort of maybe not yeah. hardened your yes, definitely. Views a little? Uh, yes, because when that flag came down, I of course go into university and they were always saying, oh yes, the flag's down and all this stuff. It's all triumphant, you know. Yeah. There's no respect. And I, I just remember being hardened because I've never had that experience before. Yeah, being so, what hardened? Oh, hardened. Hardened, yeah. So I've never had that experience before, and a lot of what the traditional units in fairness have said, oh don't trust them and all this stuff about oh well they'll take take an arm and you know I saw it myself and yes I experienced that and then I, hard, I became a bit more hard line that stage so. yeah yeah um so that so I suppose while we're, we're talking about university I, I went to Queen's 2006-2011 studied law was it like like yourself it was a bit of a culture shock because schools are divided so people are obviously they are effectively apartheid I went to like a state school, which is like what so nominally Protestant, but there's no Protestant in class, so there's no real aspect to it. And then, so it's it's kids wearing Man United tops, and I suppose it was just a it was just a bit of a well, everyone's wearing GA tops. These are this is um a bit of a culture shock. Like um, you just read the Constitution of the GA. It, it's a, it's a inherently political organization. Not everyone is in it. But just read the constitution. It's it's central goal is about kind of reunifying the island. So that that's that's not let's just be honest about that. So um, not that I am against it at all. But let's not play mind games. We live in a divided society. To say that um, uh, to say that you should just suck it up and like you're being a bigot for even mentioning it. It's just not. It's just not the case. So that they I mean in terms of GAA, it is a political organisation in that sense. But then there's also, the, you know, obviously there's normal people here at GAA. There's they're not political and they fight for sport, and I have no problem with that. But I suppose the political ethos, yes, there's a problem there. And in saying that, you know, in terms of East Belfast GAA, I also don't agree with those, you know, the security alerts against that. Yeah, oh, geez, that's, I, that's that's not repugnant. That, that's repugnant to me as well. And it's more just learning how to, you know, respect for each other and. I suppose I'd be quite happy to even meet people who do play GA. Yeah. You know, they're probably normal people. I have, at any time I was in the lectures and I was sitting, there's a big, ah, jeez, I can't remember his name now, but I'm pretty sure he's a big up in Armagh or Tyrone, the seniors. Never any hostility, no, never any bad words. I would sit and chat, chat away to him and I would talk about my rugby. He said, I, well, I might even know wearing a rugby jersey. I, don't, I, probably, I probably worn out in rugby jersey. The, People say, oh, Ulster jersey, but there's nothing in the Ulster constitution about the rugby club to send away that. And it's got the red hand, which is just what Tyrone have. So yeah, I don't understand it. So rugby's all island anyway, and so the red hand is an Irish symbol anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I suppose I didn't really have any any issues, but I can understand. I've spoken to other people. Um, a friend of mine who was in the English and poetry department just maybe some of the, the, the lessons were just you could openly disparage the, the old Ulster banner flag and just, just as given that, that that fair game kicking and just um, and then it's just given that United Ireland is inevitable if we work towards that and uh, well anyone who agrees with dis disagrees with that they're a bigot um, I was sort of what a, what a friend would have said um, funny, funny enough, I think you know, one of his friends would wear in his band uniform. I don't think he got any, any problem, troubles with that, trouble for that, but um, yeah, it could be fun. I imagine if um, swathes of guys started walking around Queen's with band uniforms. Do you think that would that cause trouble? It probably <laughs> would, but in saying that, I like these band uniforms as well. I mean, they're quite nice uniforms. Yeah. And, I, you know, I have no problem with them, but I mean... I don't think it, it wasn't a band uniform, it was like a t-shirt with like oh. pride of whatever on it. But, I mean, that's no different from a GA jersey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. But you wouldn't see that, though. You wouldn't see it. Well, apart from that, that guy, I, I don't know, I'm saying that, I don't know if that would happen much. Um, um, and then there, there's that interest in the count on the social media now, sort of trying to act, what, agitate or, or act in a wee bit to maybe raise this issue about whether or not Queen is a coal house for, for unionists. Um, just, I think they need to be heard. 
I don't think it's right to just say like call your call someone a bigot just for raising an issue, especially with with a community who are so accustomed to calling out injustices and inequalities mm-hmm. and even the smallest little things as being unequal or wrong. And then as soon as you maybe say this, oh, I'm not too sure about that. Oh, you're a bigot. So uh, I think it should be listened to. Absolutely, because I mean there were attempts to ban the poppy in Queens, and I mean in terms of wearing the poppy, I wore poppy in Queens once, and I was told by I suppose one of my friends, "Oh, well, why are you wearing that?" And knows someone's going to say something. Of course, I wore it anyway, and nobody said anything. Yeah, thankfully. But uh, no, there is, there is definitely a, a courthouse perception. And yeah. at the end, they whether it's real or not, if there's a perception, it needs to be tackled. You know, if that's what people think. Yeah, I think it's startling that the head the head of law when I was there, Colin Harvey, just the. <laughs> I think he's still with Queens, but yet he's come out just as completely on a box. There's no subtlety, there's no nuance. It's just like, you know, that are now, let's have it. Um, I like, I don't know, I don't know if that's uh, really what the university should be doing. To be critical thinking. Yeah, I, I only see that really well from him anyway, but uh, I don't know. I, I think. Colin Harvey, obviously, I don't know him personally, but I mean, you know, I, d- I think there should be more objective viewpoints, and obviously, I don't know if he still lectures, sir, but you know, but you need to take into account, obviously, the junior students, you know, they could feel that, that might not be appropriate, but you know. Yeah. Um, well, uh, it's an interesting topic, and like I said, I think it should, all sides should be heard. Um, so, mo- moving on, as I mentioned, uh, I don't the correct terminology, technically, for the know you, like we are a member of the LGBTQ yeah. <laughs> community. Is that, is that the way you'd say it? Uh, if you I'm a member of this. Well, yeah, I mean, it's all, it's, a, it's, it's an easy way of saying that you're a member of it, but yeah, there isn't really uh, an LGBT community, I suppose, in that sense, but yeah, it, it's more, you know, I, I just happen to be gay, and of course you meet other gay people, and that's sort of where the community aspect comes from. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you mentioned at school, you had to be hidden. Mm. You know, was that process of finding yourself, discovering yourself, and then coming out? Was that very hard, or did it? Uh, very hard. In many ways, I'm actually. Uh, it's a wonder I'm still here. Actually, um, you know, within school, if you're keeping all that to yourself. I mean, you obviously have things like suicidal thoughts, depression, and all that. And of course, I never told anyone. Never even told my own family because my yeah. family was not really accepting of it either uh, at that time. But uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't really know how to. I just kept it to myself. I was quite withdrawn. I kept on my studies, and that was me. Was university more liberating. Yeah. It was more liberating, but I've had bad experiences because any time I did tell somebody I was gay, it always turned out wrong. So they, you, you never mean like they didn't, they didn't appreciate it or didn't they didn't accept it? They sort of thought it was weird. They would treat you differently. You got to be careful. I mean, some of these friends are all touchy feely, and then as soon as you tell them they're not touchy feely anymore, they right, okay, yeah, yeah. Um, um, I suppose you could say, I'm sorry. Do you, you brothers or sisters? I have one brother. One brother. What age is he? He is. I think he's 32 now, I think it's pretty yeah. recently, yeah. But you got a good relationship with, with your, your family as well? Uh, yeah, a good relationship. I suppose when my dad died, uh, it was only just me and my brother and that was it. Yeah. And then obviously yeah, my mum as well. Yeah, and he's still in Northern Ireland? He's still in Northern Ireland. He, still in Northern Ireland. He, he lived in Newton Orange, but he lives in East Belfast. Now. Okay. And, uh, you know, I suppose the thing is, I, I think there, there's a mindset if you're Pro union, that you're just the, the caricature of a unionist, you know, border hat wearing or just yeah. um, an orange man or a loyalist or the fans, or you're a bigot. So I think you're certainly breaking that mold. Absolutely, it's very tough because you don't get any thanks for it. You just get you get Republicans who, of course, don't want this to happen because it suits them to paint us as big yeah, as. Yeah. And then you've got units who say, "Oh no, homosexuality is wrong, it's a wrong nation." And of course, that's accepted. I mean, the mean, the mean, that, look, that's, that's true. But the DP just don't seem to crack down on that. I mean, you've had DP elected reps come out of all sorts of homophobic statements. Yeah, yeah. And nothing's done about it. Yeah, but it is fascinating. I sort of saw this coming. Uh, this the. About gay marriage now, about abortion liberalisation. I felt I saw this coming because if you look at, I'm uh, pretty careful since the pandemic, but I think it was someone, uh, it was a bit, bit of underhand tactics, someone was doing this, DM to Callum Cameron uh, of the DUP, 
on the lift it, what she said, and she said something like that, like, don't worry, like, hang tight, there's a lot of the people here that aren't like that, and it's, it's going to come. Did you see that? Right. Ha Hannah Cameron? Hannah, yes. Hannah. Someone leaked a, a private exchange from a few years ago. It was leaked a few years ago, just saying, like, you know, just don't worry, it's going gonna, it's gonna to happen. Oh, yes, I, I know she, well, private, well, it said that she privately would support it, but I don't know if that's yeah. true. That's just, so what I'm saying is, I think, like her, there's a lot of people in the UP who are, could not give a rat's ass, but they're just hamstrung by the, the diehards. Yeah. Um, and I, it was, and then, so that was interesting when the, it was the UP councillor was elected and she was gay. Yeah, although you don't care for her. <laughs> yeah, what's her name again? Uh, Alison Dennison. Yeah, but it was interesting the person talking to her was Pam Cameron. So yeah, um, and you look at like Alexis Simon Hamilton, you know, for, he hasn't said anything about it, but you know these guys are the sort of guys I hung about with because I suppose we'll maybe get in that very briefly. You know, I, I, when I was growing up, um, this caricature of the of a unionist doesn't drink, doesn't party, very reserved, very cold. Green Press Bikini or whatever. Mm -hmm. I didn't meet anyone like that. I just knew lots of people who are like chill on the union. They're British and they're Irish. They drank, they partied. Uh, most of them went over to Scotland for university. So, what, can you comment on that? It's just that the, the perception of what a unionist is and what some of those, I like unionists, but like just pro union, it doesn't hate Britain, um, doesn't reference 800 years. At every turn, can you comment on on what the real unionist party is? Yeah, well, I mean, the real unionist party, I would say, is quite secular, quite open-minded, quite, I'd say, they're quite relaxed. But you then obviously have a hard, I mean, you have a hard line element of unionism, which you know they might be hard line for very good reason. They probably had bad experiences yeah. with Republicans, so that's probably where it comes. In. I think Pete Shirley does great work on this, where he just, I think, everyone wants you know, extremists just want everyone to be black and white. Um, and the perception is Protestants are bigots, Catholics are, sorry, Pro well, Protestant Unionists are just inherently bigoted. Yeah, There's kind of that. Well, there is that perception. I mean, yeah, I mean, some Unionists, you know, there is bigotry, and that's a fact. It's, it's, I don't really need it, you know, so it's in the news, and there are many other yeah. Unionists who are quite liberal and quite open minded. Yeah, but the, the, the perception that I think some people want to paint is that Unionists, oh, yes, yeah. Protestants <laughs> are bigoted and backward. And the Republicans, Nationalists, and some of the Catholics are virtuous and by by the right being bestowed with fairness and equality and uh, kindness. But you scratch beneath that, and you find that there is sectarianism definitely within Republicanism. Yeah, and it's, it's 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 crazy. In twenty twenty, we still have glorification of the IRA terrorism uh, from years and years ago, yeah. and we have a rewind of history. I mean, that's that's fact. And. I think even the politicization of the Irish language is bad as well, because I mean, there are people out there who want to just learn a language and you know, they don't want to hold the whole politics of it, but then there's people who of course have to bring politics. To yeah, I remember being at a, I'm not against Irish language at all, like I, when I was in, when I was in a, an Erasmus year abroad in Toulouse, I had a friend from, from, from Galway, he taught me a few terms like Ishmisha Brian, Thomas Akatu, but I remember being at a event with Stormont and some Irish band were singing, they, they, they didn't talk about how they were Irish language activists. The whole thing was about how the British came here 200 years ago, wiped out our language, per, poor, uh, uh, um, just beat us and uh, hated us and excluded us. And it was just it was very, very aggressive and in, in your face. And you can, so with that, 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 I find that whole thing was very startling and off putting. So, yeah, I, I get what you're saying on, on that aspect. Um, but I mean, in terms of that, I mean, you go back even more and say, I mean, I suppose the, the ancient Irish people would have been, you know, Celtic, they would have had the Celtic religion, and you had Christianity imposed on them. That's kind of where the Celtic cross comes from. So, I mean, where, where does that <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, like, in the whole thing of, like, um, I need to get back to what we're saying about the, the Unionist body and what it's really like. But um, even recently, was it when those singing priests got, um, they got the, they got the OBE or something? And then, of course, people from the Nationalist Republican community were outraged that they could take these colonial, these colonial titles. But of course, the Catholic Church, as itself, <laughs> the Roman Catholic Church is a colonial, sponsored colonialism empire. The Catholic Church paid for Spanish and Portuguese explorers to 
colonize um, wipe out the natives in South America. So by taking that whatever ordina ordinations or ordinances of the Catholic Church, so um, yeah, this idea that one community is inherently bad, one community is inherently good, virtuous, kind is 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 it's nonsense. Yeah, yeah and so what what I'm, I think was want to say was Pete Cho had done some fantastic work in actually breaking it, breaking this down. And the idea that all unionist Protestants are against gay marriage, all Catholic Republican nationalists are for it is actually completely wrong. Mm -hmm. A lot more nationalist Republicans are against it than you think, and a lot more Protestant unionist royalists are for it. But to take abortion, I mean, my experience is unionists are actually not, uh, unionists would be more upset about homosexuality, not abortion, but mm -hmm. I think Catholics, you know, abortion's a big thing to them, yeah. but homosexuality isn't, so it's, it's, a funny, it's a funny world. Yeah, yeah. So, that's sort of always been my bugbear of mine. Just that these, um, there, there are caricatures of the, the unionist, loyalist, and they're quite prevalent in DP, but I don't see that on the ground. No, I know a lot of pro union minded people wouldn't even describe as unionists, just they don't even know history, which is probably good mm -hmm. in a way. Um, who are yeah, pro union but are the most chilled out liberal, play computer games, they go on holiday, they work, they go get a drink, they party. Uh, yeah, but that's, 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 that's not the, um, that's certainly not Hart's story that's told. Um, so, you then, so maybe just looking at that a wee bit more, um, very interesting. One of the reasons, like I said, I started this or wanted to do this is because you know, there's no, no end of ven venues or avenues you can go down or go into to get in touch with you know, Republican youth culture. Um, whereas there's very little you know, for a young unionist or loyalist to express themselves in terms of podcasts or videos. There, there is a little bit we're writing. Um, uh, so, if we take for an example, Ireland Simpsons fans, that's quite, you've seen that haven't you? Yes, yeah. So, again, so Republicans nationalist, good, virtuous, kind, Protestant unionist, nasty, villainous, but on the wrong side of history. But yet, if you go on to these sites that Half their postings are just generic stuff about, oh yes, I love the Irish, I'm, I'm Irish, yes, I'm part of the love the Irish, and just totally chill out stuff. Same with these different podcasts, but then thrown in with it will be stuff about uh, the bad British Army, the bad REC, um, police brutality, so on and so forth. Um, how, how do you see that sort of, this new world now, where I think Ian Emerson talked about that. I think his uncle got killed, and the, the next day or a week after, he um, went on a cross community trip, and everyone said sorry for him, sorry to him. Whereas now it's very normal to be a middle class nationalist Republican in the north and south, and to think the IRA were totally right on. Oh well, yeah. I mean, it's fake news. It's Use, it's the use of memes, it's the use of something short and simple, and you know, as you, you, you know yourself as an artist, that a picture paints a thousand words. So it's all propaganda, and it's it's just trying to rewrite history. And I think, uh, particularly amongst the youth, we didn't experience what happened here, and they didn't have the experience. They just buy it all in, and unfortunately, I think there's a narrative now that the IRA fans was justified and it was necessary, which is absolute nonsense, because even back in the late 60s and early 70s, the IRA were a minority. I mean, it was all about civil rights and the SDLP and all, but and you, you don't hear that side of history anymore. It's all about IRA, guns and glorification. That's, that's completely wrong, really. So take for an example, Aaron Simpson's fans. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're probably more extreme one. So it's just completely normal to refer to uh, the English as tans, and, i.e. the black and tans, and to mock them and to express hatred for, for that people and the same for um, unionists you can see memes where it's just 
Carsley said that they're all idiots and they're all you know, it's sectarianism, and bigotry, and I, one thing I don't like is I don't like the term Brit. They seem to mm. use the term Brit quite casually. I, in the Unionist Committee, nobody calls anyone yeah. Brit, and yeah. I would take Brit to be derogatory. Yeah. Actually, yeah. a hate term to be yeah. honest. Yeah. So what? So okay. So we had the Good Friday Agreement. John Hume, uh, champion, stole his clothes. Mm -hmm. His whole ideology is one island with two mindsets. We need peace, reconciliation, justice, equality. But and do, is there any sense in the South and up north about truly um, seeing unionists as a valid viewpoint, as valid people, not uh, not as foreigners, not as aliens, genuine people of this land who are just as right and normal in their viewpoint, or is there more and more a uh, uh, actually not about including them in, in this island but just sort of slowly but surely um, what working to go along with but then when the numbers are there well yeah I sort of find in terms of reconciliation and the shared future and all that stuff I find it's it's the destination is a united Ireland and you just sort of have to you know we'll do this reconciliation but it's to get a united Ireland it's not reconciliation yeah. for reconciliation's sake and I find even with, I think something called Martin said a shared island unit mm. the problem with shared island unit is you need to expand out to shared islands so you need to include the so you've got North and South do you so it has to be east and west mm. which goes back to the Good Friday Agreement and even how uh, I think the South there was a whole remember about the well, Irish Constabulary yeah. I mean oh my word I I actually was quite interested in seeing how the South of Hamlet, and it was kind of abysmally. I mean, they, there was just absolutely no give, there was no understanding of the yeah. RIC. And of course, a lot of these people were innocent Irish people, and they were all, you know, they were killed by yeah. the blood, and there is no remorse for that. It seems to be accepted, it's, it's wrong, you know. Well, I find that episode incredibly illuminating. Mm -hmm. Mia, or not Mia Martin, Baradka himself said, Look, guys, you balls it up, this is put back in United Ireland by decades or whatever something to that effect but I think that's maybe what I'm trying to say you know this idea of genuinely opening the hand and two buckets are easier carried than one we're both fair and equal your culture is equally valid as ours it's not Brits out it's not this that and the other that idea humanism of one island two people it's a very niche academic thing academics get it academics talk about it the high up politicians talk about it but the actual people on the ground you know, don't get it. And I don't know if there's a real genuine hunger or will to actually explain the union, not, not talking about unions, but to do the work, do the hard work of telling our story. Because if, if, if it truly was work done in the last 20 years, the RIC thing wouldn't have been, like, it was just normal to say that the RIC were the, like the Nazis. Um, you, you have young, you know, it made the news when some young kid wrote to the Queen, can we put our land back? You know, the Good Friday Agreement says it's not a matter of giving any land back, it's a matter of um, just down to a vote, it's down to consent. So who, who's teaching these young kids these notions of give our land back, Brits out? Well, it comes from the parents, it comes from uh, certain, certain elements within Sinn Féin, definitely comes from Sinn Féin as well. Uh, except there's maybe there might be a few people in Sinn Féin, of course, who are trying, but there's a lot of Sinners who don't try. There's a lot of Republicans on the ground, community works, etc., who definitely don't try. I mean, look at CRAD as well. I mean, it's the, the, the death of uh, Leo McKay, for example. I mean, how that was handled was also quite uh, shocking. It was really, really bad. And, you know, we, we sort of need to try and find something to sort of move on because, I mean, we don't want to be talking about ongoing issues for, like, you know, until we're old men, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Um. So, I could, I could talk more about that, but I think um, we'll move on. Maybe, maybe I'll just say, I mean, maybe just ask you, you know, re re referring to the RIC question, for things to actually work, how, how should that be handled? Well, there needs to be an acceptance and there needs to be respect because, like, I don't agree, obviously. I mean, obviously, I, I think IRA fans are abhorrent, but I just accept that Republicans, if that's what they want to think, that's what they want to think. I can't do anything about it. I can't change their thoughts. Uh, they need to accept that 
we think the RIC were just trying, we're just good, honest men who were trying to keep peace or trying to keep order. I didn't see it as this conspiracy. They have a conspiracy that the state was colluding against them to write them out, and I don't think that's true. Yeah. I honestly don't. And we also have some Republicans who put forward these sectarian ideas that oh, the Northern state was a Protestant state when it, and it really wasn't actually. There were plenty of Catholics in there, and there were also uh, plenty of people in you know within Northern Ireland. This whole Protestant state thing that was actually a reply to yeah. what. Uh, the you know, the teachers back then said about Ireland yeah. being a Catholic nation. You look at the Irish constitution way back 100 years ago, it was all about having a special role for the Catholic Church. Yeah. That is a sectarian. I mean, how you can't get more sectarian than that. I think another thing, and again, this is a tricky spot that um, unionists have because if they say anything, they're kind of just automatically a bigot. But what I find fascinating is um, up until like 1972, there was an official decree of the Catholic Church that if a Catholic and a Protestant marry it has to be raised a catholic mm -hmm. end of the matter that it was the law i imagine if northern ireland uh in its first 50 60 years had a law that said if catholic marriage protestant has to be raised protestant you know um that was um the, the idea that we were dealing with uh goodness virtue down south and that the island would have been fine if only we the, these bad northerners with their with they alone, with, with alone their capacity for discrimination, bigotry, and badness, and um, it's, it's it's foolhardy, and um, I've seen mistakes on both on all sides, and um, so th I think that's that's I think that's I, well I'd certainly like to see more of this Hume mentality of truly understanding the neighbour and the other, and um, I hope I can, I hope that's okay what I'm saying, but I'm just trying to say that. Yeah, Northern Ireland, as David Trimble said, was a coal house, but this this idea that um, we don't have problems on both sides is, is very unhelpful. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this is completely... Uh, I was going to actually talk about the bridge, but we'll come back to that later, because it's a wee bit off, <laughs> off topic. Um, just quick, we'll kind of address this, but I'll just go by the script, because um, this is the first one I'm learning. Um, Unionism, it has a PR and image problem. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, as you said yourself. Um, it's very you, you. You think of a union, you think of something very traditional or old-fashioned, and you know they're, they're socially conservative and all that stuff. I think we need to change all that. I think we need a more civic unionism. We need more secularism. And I think if we had secularism, you'd actually bring in more Catholic unionists. And mm -hmm. I, I love to bring Catholic unionists yeah. to the UUP, for example. And um, I, I just feel within unionism there is also. I suppose all those masses come as well. It's seen as insular. It's seen as narrow minded. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're 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 defending and we're we're losing all stuff. I think we need to break out of that. We need to be what we're for. We need to be yeah. looking for division. You know. Yeah. Well, I think if you look at just the flooring of of cultural outlets that um that uh, nationalism nationalism Republican has, it, it stretches the whole um whole spectrum from like the hard line Republicans to just chill middle class Dublin people who are, who talk about because of Brexit talk about uh, needing need the United Ireland whereas so there's that constant sort of just conversation whereas there's nobody within unionism or that culture sort of doing a PR job in terms of promoting the merits of what we have where we are where we come from the relationship that we have with not just England and London but the city of England out of Ireland, but with Scotland and how deeply entwined that is in, in the hearts of many unionists. You know, the fact that we can see Scotland from here, the fact that we've all got many of us have friends and relations, family there. Um there, there, there's a heck of a lot of potential and work that could be done there. You know, what, what, what would you like in terms of the PR and I know your sentence being more secular, but what could actually be done? Like, does it need like a think tank? Does it need uh, not just orange and, and band culture, but or ways to express the more moderate secular culture? We need more diversity and not, not just even, you know, unionism would be diverse, but that diversity is not represented at the political level. Mm. It's definitely not. And I think definitely the two main unionist parties, certainly within my own party, I do raise it over and over again. We need more diverse candidates. We need more, you know, bring in the LGBT candidates, you know, there's ethnic minorities, more women, etc. And we need that to be shown because if you bring those, uh, 
if you bring those people to the table, they will bring up issues that you wouldn't have thought of. So, for yeah. example, I'm a man, so I, I don't know what it's like to be pregnant, but a woman obviously does. Yeah. Uh, we need those uh, people brought to the table, we need them bring those issues, and you have greater understanding. I think it will break down quite a lot of the uh, barriers towards you know, ignorance of immunism, or uh, whether it's LGBT issues or abortion or whatever. And we need to bring in those uh, people at, at that stage. You could have a think tank, but I mean, I would find, even on social media, there are units out there who do try to put forward these views and do try to spread understanding. Yeah, there, are, there, there's some great accounts out there, but it's all kind of haphazard. There's nothing sort of centralized and totally coherent. Mm. There's that guy. Uh, uh, he's he's a member of the Orange Order, and he's incredibly liberal. Choya or something. Oh yeah, <laughs> he's a good guy. I like him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there's a couple of others. I probably, I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking of a vibe I've, I've experienced. Um, who are doing some interesting stuff. There's that guy, Quincy Dugan, he does all those talks down south, mm -hmm. um, which, are, which is very interesting. Um, but it's, it's all quite haphazard, maybe. It uh, doesn't have a real punch that uh, you can see maybe from what the Shared Ireland podcast and different uh, avenues. Um, so the other thing is, uh, I mean, nationalism is definitely on a journey. It's just easier to because it's got an end goal and it can continually lobby and work on that. Um, unionism is more reactive. Um, how do you um, how, 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 do you, how do you work that? Like, how can unionism be more of a, of a journey or a more? Well, we we need to break through this siege mentality for a start. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to stop demonising anyone who's suggesting the ideas and. I find within unionism, you're a Lundy if you suggest any new yeah. ideas, if you show any sort of liberalism, yeah. even the Irish language. I, I uh, made a tweet that I learned a few words of the Irish yeah. language, and oh my word, the amount of abuse, I got <laughs> threats and everything for that. It, it wasn't even a political tweet, I was actually just you know having a joke. I thought there'd be a few people who would uh, maybe you know joke at me or something, but it wasn't actually a political tweet, because uh, I'd be quite friendly if there are fans, just any materials, yeah. I learned something, it's fine, but I mean, I think unionism needs to break through that mentality. I mean, I wouldn't see the Irish language as something as a threat. Obviously, there are people out there who will politicise it. Sinn Féin, for example, wanting bilateral science due to consultations. Yeah. That's wrong, because obviously, who goes to consultations? But I think uh, within the Irish language, we just need to see that it's not this big conspiracy that's made out to be. Yeah. And to, I'm just on a record, I would, I would be opposed to an Irish language act because I don't think you need one. I think that was settled in a good fair agreement. Yeah. And I think with sandwich, I prefer us to be putting money into the health service, mm -hmm. personally, but I understand a good fair agreement there are legal requirements, I think, to have so much funding for the Irish language and so much funding for Foster Scots and all that stuff. Yeah. I suppose, um, sorry if I can just say something, the way I would break it down when it comes to Irish language, in terms of Irish speakers, my experience is a lot broader than my parents. So when it comes to Irish speakers, I know these guys from when I was doing my Erasmus in France, who I spoke to and met and they taught me some. I know Mick Fielty speaks Irish, I know Eamon Malley speaks Irish, um, I know many others and I've heard through many others, but when it comes to you know people like my parents, even young people my age who haven't maybe had the experiences I've had, unfortunately the only people they saw speaking Irish in the 70s and 80s were people in the Republican movement. Mm -hmm. So this idea that you're a bigot if you say, oh, there's a little bit of baggage there, it's like you're being gaslit or something you're being played with, like, how can you not say that it hasn't got it? Was contaminated with, with, with that, that would be fair. That, that's, that's sort of fair. Yeah, I, I think that is uh, fair to say. Uh, there is a politicization of the Irish language that is wrong, uh, but there are plenty of people who just want to learn it. Yeah, uh, you know, there's a, I suppose you can get jobs in the Irish language, you can write about the Irish language, and that's fine. I mean, you know, as an artist yourself, you know, maybe people like Irish poetry, you know, if that's their thing, let them yeah. do it. Yeah, yeah, you know, Seamus Heaney, no one ever came and stand there, but I moved it recently, you know, he. I, I, I speak French and in French and I see the difference if, you, if you're just monolingual that, that it is what it is but if you can speak another language it just enters opens up a whole different area of your brain and way of thinking and understanding things and I think Seamus he spoke to that effect of, of knowing Irish knowing Irish poetry and literature it just opens up a whole different world and that, that fascinates me it doesn't scare me I'm not offended by it I want to I'd love to get into that um, but that's that's a very niche academic 
angle, and I think it should be considered of those people who, who lived through the troubles and their own experience, as I said, of the Irish language is, was, was negative, and to suggest that it's got no issues at all, mm-hmm. and anyone has got issues about it, it's just, we're, we live in a divided society, let's get real, so um, yeah. Um, but in terms of, of, of ha- having a journey, if I can just say quickly, you know, it was interesting, Boris Johnson, he said, you know, if anything's got a European funding, it has a European flag spl- splat on it, whereas, you know, in Scotland, um, huge amount of funding comes, projects are funded by London, but there's no signage on it. So I wonder, you know, is, is that the sort of thing that could be done, just to sort of better illustrate how uh, this relationship, how, how we go hand in hand and we, we, we go forward together? Well, yeah, I mean, if you take COVID, you've had furlough yeah. at the NHS. If that, that, that's all funded by Britain, it's funded by the block grant. If we didn't have that, um, there are no solutions that the government certainly wouldn't be funding us, you know? Yeah, that, that, that's truly fascinating. You know, just the, it's unfortunate the, 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 the level of dependence in, in a way, but, you know, um, just just uh, those benefits that, that can so often be ignored should be acknowledged. And it's, it was fascinating, you know, if you look at up at Derry, um, I think on our free dairy, if you're under free dairy, I think they had an NHS um, signage up for tapping for the NHS on a sort of Republican mural or a Republican monument. So that was quite it was enlightening or interesting. Well, you, you mentioned free dairy, but I've always seen a mural as actually saying, this is my territory, yeah, stay yeah. out. And I know, I know they think it's all wonderful, but I've always seen that free dairy as my territory. And yeah. personally, as a unionist, that makes me feel uncomfortable. And yeah. I do think that should be removed, I think, okay. Republicans. Because they go on about removing unionist murals. And some of those uh, murals, I mean, I when I went to school, I worked past plenty of UDF and UDA murals. Mm. They're no longer there now. Mm. They're replaced with Blair and they're replaced with George Best. But Republican murals, I'm not seeing that. There's seen, the IRA ones seem to still be there. Yeah. And the free dairy, free dairy definitely, I think that mural needs to go first. Yeah, OK. I, I, would, I probably wouldn't be there exactly. <laughs> it's, just, it's just so part of the hallowed but, 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 that it'd be almost impossible. But I suppose, what, what you're getting at where uh, unionist has to, stuff has to come down or Republican stuff has to stay or more has to go up. The thing that I find most interesting and that sort of chipped away at my naivety, you could say, was, um, excuse me, I'll just, I'll just take out everything. <laughs> my, my, my naivety was, was, was sort of shaken a little bit was when, I mean, let's take another wee draw here, this beautiful Cuban cigar. <laughs> Are you trying to be Castro or something? <laughs> <laughs> One of the most interesting or illuminating things that I came across was, I remember McGuinness uh, being on flank by other Sinn Féin um, elected reps. He, he gave a press conference in Downing Street and said, you know, the, the Good Friday Agreement is our peace is on life support. You know, we, we need help, we need support. And then that night, the other news was that uh, there was a motion in the Dairy Strabane Council, whatever, to remove the prefix Dairy in London from London, London Dairy. Yeah. Yeah. So at the moment, you're saying this is fragile and needs urgent attention, and at the same time, you're trying to remove that. Um, and I think, as you're saying, you know, there seems to be uh, uh, just content, whether it be Belfast City Council or whatever, to remove these. Um, sig- sig- symbols and emblems, and then on the other side, that isn't there. And then obviously, down south, when you try to introduce even like a, mo- a modest, this wasn't a commemoration, this or this wasn't a celebration, this RIC thing. You know, when you try to introduce this modest 10 15 minute historical commemoration, you know, there was national uproar. Um, so that's so I think that that, that that could be looked into, you know, just in terms of. Really, what 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 is the, the end goal in in, in uh, uh, these em- emblems, these signs and monuments? Um, do we do we need do we, do we need more understanding? I suppose understanding. I suppose it depends what the objective is. Uh, these murals are part of tourism here, so people come up and see them. Yeah, so yeah. if you remove them, <laughs> you remove your tourism. 
Uh, it depends on the objective. If you want them for tourism, I suppose then that has to be considered. But if you want them to uh, share to Sally, if you want them to show outreach, then there obviously needs to be some give and take, you know. And I sort of find venues and we do give quite a lot, but there's yeah. very little that we get back, yeah. you know. There's a, you know, you're, you're a writer, you write the newsletter, do this, that, and the other. One, one piece that I've been wanting to write about was, um, you know, the, the numbers when it comes to Brexit, 56 to whatever, and in Northern Ireland it was what it was, and Scotland what it is what it was. But the, you, you look at, um, you know, what happened in, in the South, um, just before and after partition, when the, when the, the, the elections, they, they, you always talk about the landslide, terms of um, the Sinn Féin representatives, but if you actually look at the numbers, um, it was something like mid to high 40s voted for Sinn Féin, 30% or so, 25-30% voted for the Unionist, and 20% or so voted for the old constitutional Irish parliamentary party, but of course there was no recognition for the lack, the, the lack, the, the lack of there being a, an overwhelming decision, but of course people who, who did get the most, which wasn't even half, just plowed on through and when it came to um, creating that Southern Ireland state, there was no turn, there was no respect or um, equality or accommodation of different views. You know, if you look at the, the veterans who came back from the First World War, they were absolutely humiliated, castigated, cast away from society. All the monuments down there were, were taken down. Um, the Boyne Obelisk was blown up, the King Billy Monument was blown up. Um, so it's interesting now when we're talking about like, well, it, it wasn't it wasn't categorical the decision, so we've got to go back and we've got to, but when, when it was in the other foot, it was just flying on through. I think Devil Air himself said, you know, we're going to demolish these units and just throw up the rock in the road there, the rock in the road. It's ethnic cleansing, meaning you're wiping out culture, you're wiping out history, and it's 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 very sad that you know we're we're not, we're not we're not at that stage where we can sort of you know, respect difference, but unfortunately it's just the, the politics here, you know. Yeah, and um, I think you you look at Dublin there, and I think the, the one of Arthur Guinness's um, descendants he has passed away, and he was a spearhead um, protecting and preserving Georgian Dublin. So I think it was a while in the twenties, thirties, forties. Where a lot of this Georgian architecture, beautiful Georgian architecture, was seen as some sort of like alien um, blight on the Irish land. Um, thankfully, that's not the mindset now. But there's no recognition really that um, it's the, 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 in terms of the relationship with Britain and Ireland. It's always an antagonism. It's always a bad thing. It's 800 years of British oppression. But that's not your view. That's not my view. There doesn't seem to be. In, ter in terms of even that type of stuff, architecture, a lot of the architecture comes from the Normans. Mm. And a lot of people forget that. That's what it means to be no normal. And a lot of people, you know, a lot of those cathedrals, a lot of those houses, it's Norman architecture. I think Carrick Fergus Castle is a Norman castle. Yeah. So, you know, that's where a lot of it comes from. It's not even really that British at all. The British were taking over, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, was it 1066 or whatever? Mm. Or, you know, that, that nobody's ever talked Nobody about that. Nobody talks about that. Um, give us, you know, you know the, the people that. The, who, 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 was that was the Normans in 1066 kicked out the Saxons or what? Um, it? it was the Normans who, so you had the Battle of Hastings 1066, so you had the, I think you had the Angles under uh, uh, Harold Godwinson, uh, they defeated the five kings that were trying to take over and then they came down into the south, I think it was Stamford Bridge and then the Normans obviously beat them and the Normans just took over and I think French was spoken, you had fishing yeah. and, they, and that was that, but they, that, that was Britain from there on. Yeah, yeah. And then there was the Cambro Normans from Wales started going over to Ireland mm -hmm. later on, like the more 13, 1400s or something. Yes. Um, and then you had, the, even before the Normans, you had the Roman conquest. Yeah. So, I mean, it goes on and on and on. Everyone invades everyone. But this, but this idea is still just among, going back to that, among Irish youth that I'm perceiving online, it's just like 800 years of British oppression. This is an evil island next, next door to us. There's nothing in there that could be taken. From them now, they're they're all little Englanders, evil because of Brexit, and that um, we, we, we can acknowledge no um, fine arts. We, we, we can no no bragger did say that there was portraits of the Queen and so on and so forth down south, and he wasn't offended by them. But there's no um, se again sense of tr trying to understand the inter. It is almost unavoidable 
interlinking, intertwining in the roots of the two islands intermingle so much. Yeah, I mean, it goes really to shared symbols, and you know, I'm not offended by Irish culture, I'm not offended by you know, those types of things. I mean, it's obviously whenever I play first solemn, obviously it's a culture shock, but I mean, you just sort of get used to it, and then it's not really that offensive. I just get it's part of the culture, really. Yeah, but you, you would consider yourself Irish and British? Uh, I consider myself British because I'm part of the UK. You have an Irishness in the sense that we're on, I suppose, the island of Ireland. Maybe you can say the Irish Unis. I mean, if you go over to Britain, sure, they think we are Irish yeah. anyway. And uh, Northern Ireland, I would identify with uh, because obviously this is Northern Ireland. And, you know, I, I would sort of see myself, I mean, identity doesn't have to be binary, it's, it's a whole lot of different things. Yeah. I'd be gay, for example, and, and, and you know, homosexuality is something that goes, you know, all over the world. Yeah. The, the rainbow flag. So, you know, identity, there's a whole lot more to identity than just British and Irish. Yeah. Like, Put on record, you know, I am incredibly Irish. I'm so passionate about being Irish, but I'm also very British. And what's really interesting, and this has come out more after Brexit, it's very interesting to see these people who thought you were crazy for having this dual identity, mixed identity, the same people who laughed and mocked you for being British and Irish are now the ones who are so stridently saying, well, I'm Irish and European. And, and you're taking away my uh, my European identity with with Brexit, mm -hmm. so certainly. You well, I mean, in terms of that, sure, Mary McDonald shared a platform with Nigel Farage, and mm. in fact, I remember when I studied politics, Sinn Fein was at the EU. That was that was Sinn Fein yeah. back in two thousand nine. They were at the EU. They were against the Lisbon Treaty. I have to actually say, some of the reasons for being against it were legitimate, but yeah. we forget that you know Sinn Fein nowadays is seen as pro EU, but they're really not. They're yeah. Really friend. If, if, if you want to get, though I, I think again that you know, uh, that's a battle maybe for further down the line for them. I, I think there may be just playing with the you love for Brussels. Mm -hmm. it actually, if, if you look certainly at the Republican Sinn Fein, I, I read their blog, it's fascinating, truly fascinating to see what they have to say about Europe that it's an imperial construct. Um, it strips Ireland of self-government. It strips Ireland of its natural resources. You just have to look at the IRA Green Book and, uh, to see what it says. So I think um, I, th I think it might be a short-term um, tactic to um, be incredibly Euro Europhilic, but I think um, if it wasn't my enemy's enemy is my friend or whatever, if it wasn't the situation was now, I think a lot more of that um, Europhobia, your skepticism, your phobia would come out. I think it could well come out uh, in, in the future. But I mean, in terms of the EU, I mean, I accept there are, we have benefited from the EU in some ways, but then there's a lot of things about the EU I don't like, such as, for example, the European Parliament can't initiate legislation, so it's yeah. a parliament that can't even make law. It comes from the uh, executive, so it's a directive, so it is. And um, there's a lot of forms of the EU you've You've so much money pumped into it, and then you've all the crazy laws, and then of course, I think I haven't looked at the parliament now in a while, but I think now the largest party I think is the Law and Justice Party. Is that yeah. I think that's the largest party now that has the Conservative wing. So the Law and Justice Party is funny because it's quite homophobic, it's very traditional, and you know, do you really want to be buddied up with these people? So you know that that's the problem. I think the EU it tries to merge all these different national yeah. cultures together, and it doesn't work. It, it truly is extraordinary the the readiness to talk about the little Englanders and the racism and xenophobia and backwardness of the British now and how it's gone to hell in that part. But no no regard for what's happening in Poland. You know, we're getting lectured by Donald Tusk talking about how bad the British are and no acknowledgement for the shit that's gone on in his backyard with this homophobic mm -hmm. Um, president that's been elected or so or not if not homophobic you know pretty old style Catholic right wing mm -hmm. um, th th there's a lack of questioning about austerity and neoliberalism you know the moment that we heard about George Osborne and all that was done from, uh, from London in terms of delivering austerity but complete um, nothing nothing is to be said about the IMF ECB and the brutal austerity that for some reason it's, it's just either ignored or seen as benevolent or necessary. So again, this sort of double think is just confusing for me. Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, the EU would be imperial in the sense that it does impose its regulations and there's problems even with the outside of the EU. I think it's made up of all the different governments, but you know, in terms of the governments, the only government that's represented from us would be the British government. The rest of the government sure have nothing to do with this, and they, of course, just play their own interests anyway. So it, it, I don't think it really works, really. Yeah. So I, well, I, so I think there, there could be problems brewing there for the south, especially now with this that they have, have ratcheted up the fiscal arrangements even further now that um, so Ireland's paying more, and their budget liabilities are are, are more pulled, and it's, it's, uh, I think yeah, there's trouble brewing there. Um, so as we've been talking for over an hour now, as we try to bring this to a close and this fine cigar comes to an end, um, I just maybe want to last two questions or so, just asking you know, how are you looking to the centenary of Northern Ireland? How, what does that mean to you? Uh, it means really for me what I suppose I'll be doing. It'll be, I'll be having a cup of tea and a unit bag mug, I'll be with a cat, I'll be looking back on the history of the Northern Ireland state. I want to see the first unit. I'd maybe like to have see BBC documentaries on the first North, uh, the first Unionist government. And I was just trying to see even, I think there's a provisional Unionist government that Edward Carson had, just in yes. case he wasn't going to yep. be given it. So I'd like to see all that. And to me, it's it's largely going to be, be you know, a normal day, just a reflection on history and things. Yeah. And I, I'd like to see a wee bit more, a wee bit more storytelling, mm. because I lived through I took a real interest in you know the centenary of 1916. Mm-hmm. It was such a cataclysmic event, and it just got the ball rolling. And it's just so central to our society going south and to Republicans up north. So I just wanted to understand it. I went down in 2015, um, walked around Dublin, RTU put on this huge um, pageantry on a. Uh, uh, I think Cat Sack- Sackville Street, as it used to be, on O'Connell Street. Um, and uh, there, there was almost like drama, on street drama, British soldiers getting accosted um, as they were encouraging people to enlist. Um, there was infographics, huge big banners at the GPO. That was 2015, the year before. We're now in 2020 and there's nothing, you wouldn't even know anything. There's these little snippets on the BBC News NI website odd thing on Twitter but I've not seen anything. You know, the centenary I think now it must be it certainly is nine months away or less than a year. So I mean I'm not really saying anything at the moment. I suppose in fairness it is COVID, which makes yeah. it more difficult. But I think we could probably try and do something. Uh, the Austria Unis Party has a lot of history and I don't think a lot of people know about it. So certainly the UP I'm sure could probably find something to find uh, from the archives and yeah, all yeah. that stuff. Um, and then so the last question really what's um your vision and hope for this place going forward? I just want us to move away from orange rain politics, I think, to get into the whole constant orange rain. It's tiring and, you know, I'm in my late 20s now. I'm sort of trying to get on a bit. I want to obviously buy a house. I want to have a good job, get into a relationship with somebody. I want to say, when I do get a relationship with somebody, am I going to be attacked for that? So I want yeah. some dumb my own hate crime. I want equality. I want affordable uh, living, etc. And that's really what matters at the end of the day. And good public services, not all this constant flags and oh he's flying this flag and oh there's the Irish flag. I find that distraction politics and unionism yeah. always tends to lose in culture. I think culture wars is unionism's biggest threat to be honest. Okay, okay. And um so in 10, 15, 20 years time uh what what, what how would you like to see this place? I like to see us more as self sufficient. So the block grant I can remember was six billion pounds it's now jumped up to ten billion. Mm-hmm. Uh, which, if you want to know about the Scotland Bridge, the Scotland Bridge is estimated to be 20 billion as well, so it's, uh, that's just how much the cost was. But uh, I'd just like to see this place, you know, more equality. I want unionism to move on in terms of the LGBT issues. Uh, we, you know, 2020, we still shouldn't have homo- homo- homophobic statements from uh, unionist representatives, uh, particularly the DUP. Uh, and we just need to try and uh, build a more genuine society, more integration within our society, which I think is going to happen anyway, because the politicians maybe haven't caught on to that. But yeah. the, normal society it is. I mean, I would I would have no problem being uh, a Republican, for example. It wouldn't really bother me. I just accept that's his views. But I just think, especially our generation, are just more open-minded in these things. And we kind of want to move yeah. on. Okay. That's really um, fascinating. Um, uh, so to wrap this up, just want to, want to say thank you very much mm-hmm. for doing this pilot inaugural episode. 
Um, <laughs> could shake your hand if I can. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to you to sign us off just by letting us know where people can find you on Twitter and Instagram and what have you. Um, I have uh, Michael Palmer on Facebook and Michael, uh, well, Michael Palmer on Twitter as well, but it's Commander MP. Commander, but actually, by the way, is in relation to a video game. I'm not a commander okay. or anything. <laughs> uh, it's Commander MP. And then Instagram, I use it, but I don't use Instagram that much. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and I'll include the links in the description below. Yeah, of course. And uh, let's hope this can provoke a little discussion. Oh yeah, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> and, uh, I hope people enjoyed this. And, uh, we'll see what happens next. Hopefully we'll have a few more of these. And, uh, yeah, thanks mm -hmm. for thanks for coming, Michael. Thank you, Brian. And, uh, thanks for everyone for listening. Thank you.